Hello, church, and welcome to Sunday School with Pastor Josh. Well, it is Passion Week. I am recording this on Thursday, as I normally do, to make sure that you have plenty of time to take time to go through your Sunday school lesson, even before Sunday morning. But uh, this week, we'll be talking about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. If you have been following along in your quarterly, the uh, Bible Studies for Life quarterly, uh, we are skipping ahead a lesson because we are actually a lesson behind. So that's on page, it begins on page 76 if you have that with you. If not, I encourage you to uh, grab a pen and paper and a Bible and sit down and uh, take some time and study God's Word with me. If you have your Bible with you, and I hope that you do, I'm going to ask you to open to 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 8, and we'll begin our lesson, The Truth of the Resurrection. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 8. Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and which on which you now stand, and by which you are now being saved, if you hold fast to the word that I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as that which is of most importance, and I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried and he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve, then he appeared to more than five hundred brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. He then appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as one untimely born, he appeared to me. Let's pray. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, how awesome it is to be able to uh, gather together, even um, in times such as this. We're able to gather together um, with technology and be able to still study your word and to be able to uh, still uh, have services and all of these things, God. And we know that this is an anxious time, that this is a time of uh, difficulty for many people. But God, we also know that you are in control of all things, that your hand is in all things, and that uh, you are watching out for uh, not just the entire world, but your people in general. God, I pray that as we're gathered together today, that you will open our eyes to uh, what it means to believe that Jesus Christ is risen from the dead and the great hope that we have. God, we thank you and praise you for uh, Jesus, for his resurrection, and for the eternal life that is now awaiting us. I pray that in Christ's name. Amen. Fake news. That seems to be all we ever hear about, whether it's the economy, unemployment numbers, the coronavirus, whether you're talking to a friend and they just don't want to uh, believe something that you're telling them. Just, fake news. It's fake news. And therefore, it has no credibility whatsoever. Well, the Jewish leaders wanted to do the same thing about 2,000 years ago. Listen to this. Matthew 28, 11 through 15. While the women were on their way, some of the guards went into the city and reported to the chief priests everything that had happened. When the chief priests had met with the elders, they devised a plan. They gave the soldiers a large sum of money and told them, You are to say his disciples came during the night and stole him away while we were asleep. If the report gets to the governor, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So the soldiers took the money and did as they were instructed. And this story has been widely circulated among the Jews to this day. Well, there's several issues with this story, first of all. But um, we'll, we'll get to that a little, little bit later on. In fact, today we're going to take a look at some of the theories around um, Jesus' death uh, for people who are naysayers, people who don't believe that Jesus rose from the dead. And we're going to equip you to be able to answer those and give you facts from the Bible, facts from um, outside of the Bible that Jesus did, in fact, raised from the dead. And so I'm looking forward to today's lesson to be able to help you in what's called apologetics, the defense of the faith. I want you to know as we open this that the resurrection is 100% true, that Jesus did in fact raise from the dead, that not only did he raise from the dead, but that we who believe in him will also be raised from the dead with him at the end of time. And we are so looking forward to that. This is a truth that you can bank your life on. A truth that is real news. A news that we can live by and proclaim boldly to everyone who will hear the message of Jesus Christ. Now, we live in an age where people do question the authority of the Bible. Um, that's why the defense of the faith, apologetics, is so important. 
because uh, we live in an age where people are looking more towards uh, proof outside of something that a group of people have said, this is the word of God. And I believe that God has given us uh, a mind to think with and that he would never ask us to believe anything irrationally. I also believe that his word is extremely, extremely powerful, that it is sharper than any two-edged sword, that the, the Spirit uses the, the Bible to change who we are and his word. And so in conjunction with Scripture and in conjunction with the Bible, uh, God has given us other evidences as well outside of the Bible to allow our minds to comprehend exactly what the word is telling us. In 2018, uh, Pastor Andy Stanley preached a message and he entitled it, The Bible Tells Me So, or The Bible Told Me So. Um, he, his, his, um, his premise is that we no longer live in an age where that's an acceptable argument. That people are looking for something more. That we don't live in a culture that believes that this, isn't, this word is the absolute authority. And we need other ways to show them and show culture that the Bible is true. And so we have to stand on a platform, of course, the foundation of God's word, knowing the truth ourselves, but also being able to explain it in light of the culture in which we live. Now, I know some people will say, well, I do believe it because the Bible told me so. But before we get too critical about that, um, I would venture to guess that there are many Christians and maybe even some of you who look at the Bible and they write off certain areas of Scripture as uh, maybe uh, falsified, maybe not falsified, but uh, created to make a point instead of uh, being actually um, a literal um, uh, recording of things that had happened. And I would say that, and I've even run into Christians, that some of you may believe that creation didn't happen in seven days, that you believe in the process of evolution. I've run into Christians who don't believe that there was a worldwide flood. There are stories in the Bible like where Elisha causes an axe head to float to the surface when there is a simple, when he puts a simple stick in the water and all of a sudden he touches the surface of the water and this axe head begins to float. We also see a story of a donkey <clears throat> who is suddenly being, uh, being allowed to open his mouth and to talk to Balaam, who's on his way to uh, curse the Israelites. And the donkey, as uh, Balaam is beating, it says, why are you beating me? There is an angel of the Lord standing before you that is ready to cut you to pieces. He's going to kill you. And so Balaam's mission turns from cursing the Israelites to blessing the Israelites. Now, to be clear, I believe that all of these things happened in the way that God said that they do in his word. I don't understand how they happened. I don't understand how um, a lot of uh, different things in the Bible came to be, where we see these miracles, where people are being raised from the dead. I don't understand um, how creation was created in seven days, and yet the earth looks old to us. What I do believe is that there are many things that the Bible calls us to take by faith. We looked a couple weeks ago at Hebrews chapter 11, and uh, there were things that uh, Paul says that by faith we believe. By faith we believed in creation. By faith we believe that Jesus has risen from the dead. All of these things that we have to take by faith. But when we're talking to unbelievers, guess what they don't have yet? They don't have faith. And so there are ways that we need to be able to talk to unbelievers and approach them and allow them to know, hey, these things are true. And here's some evidences. Here are some evidences. Today we're going to look at the most unbelievable account of all things that the Bible claims is true. That is that a man raised from the dead by his own power. God raised Jesus from the dead, but the Bible is clear in John chapter 10, uh, verse 18. Jesus says, no one takes it, my life, his life, from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have the authority to lay it down and I have the authority to take it up again. This is the charge I have received from my father. Now we're going to focus in on verses uh, one through three. 
And so I want to read that again and then uh, begin to um, extrapolate uh, the things that are in the verses. Now, I want to make clear for you, brothers and sisters, the gospel that I preached to you, which you received, on which you have taken your stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold to the message I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I pass to you as utmost importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. Paul has a few, a few points that he wants to make. Uh, he, he is writing this section uh, to make very clear the truth of the resurrection of the gospel. The main point, however, seems to be uh, that he is going to argue the facts around the resurrection itself. Those things that he believes are the most critical or the things that he is sharing. Paul sees that the church, um, there are some people in the church who are spreading the lie that Jesus didn't really raise from the dead. Or if he did raise from the dead, he did not raise bodily from the dead. There's a um, view of the Gnostics that existed back in uh, ancient times where the material things are evil, but spiritual things are good. And therefore, Jesus would not have raised from the dead bodily because why would God raise something evil from the dead? And yet Paul is making very clear that a very important part of the gospel is that Jesus Christ did indeed raise bodily from the dead, that he was indeed resurrected, and that it's an out and out lie to say that Jesus did not raise from the dead. And so what we see here is a very clear display of a recapitulation of the gospel um, and an apologetic defense for the reality of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Because without the resurrection, Paul knows that the gospel is nothing, that there is no gospel if Jesus Christ did not raise from the dead. So he wants to make clear, this is what you believe. You believe that Jesus Christ died for your sins, that he was buried, and that he raised from the dead. And then his main point is, but if you don't believe that, here are some evidences to back up what I'm saying. Without the resurrection, we have to assume and understand that death still would have the final word. Without the resurrection, we still have no hope. Without the resurrection, Jesus' uh, bodily resurrection, we are still under the condemnation of sin. We are left in our trespasses and sin under the wrath and the full judgment of God. Without the resurrection, the grave is our final destination and hell is the home of our spiritual bodies without the resurrection we have to also understand that that means God is not powerful enough to make creation new again if he can't even raise somebody from the dead and make him new put him in a glorified body if he cannot have the power to raise us up and make us new again then what hope is there that he can actually take all of creation and renew all of it for us? You see, without the resurrection, the best we can hope for is that we get out of this life alive. And even Jesus didn't get out of this life alive. The resurrection of Jesus is the centerpiece of Christianity. If we pull that centerpiece out, the rest of our faith and the rest of our foundation collapses around it. From the text, it's apparent that Paul had preached a very clear message that the people rightly understood, that they received, that they stood upon, that their foundation was strong. And yet he's going back and he's saying, listen, I'm afraid that there are people who are among you who are wolves that are looking to devour your faith. So you need to remember what I taught you. So here's the first question that I have for you. If you were to share the gospel with a person, what elements of the gospel need to be shared for a non-believer to come to Christ? So I just asked you, what elements of the gospel need to be shared with a non-believer in order for them to come to Christ? The gospel 
needs to be made clear to all people. Um, we need to understand that when we're approaching a person who's a non-believer, that they have no basis, no basis whatsoever as to why Jesus is even necessary. So it'd be very hard to start from where Paul is starting exactly. So here are some elements that I believe and that uh, many others believe are the elements of the gospel that need to be shared in order to have a quote unquote full gospel presentation. And so um, I, I don't know how many of you have gone through evangelism explosion or um, XCE, the Generation X um, uh, evangelism explosion or some other form of sharing the gospel. Um, I prefer the um, life on mission tracts um, because I think they're clear and they're easy to do. And I'll put a link down below for that as well. Um, here, are the, here are the five areas that I believe need to be shared um, in order for somebody to come to the realization of their need for Christ and to come to faith. First of all, we have to uh, acknowledge God. God is the holy author of everything seen and unseen. That God has created the world, that he created it perfectly, that he created it without sin in it, that he looked at all of creation and he said that it was good. And that God required that mankind live a certain standard, that they uh, worship and love him. And the reason that he did that wasn't to force us to do things and to force us to worship him. But on the flip side, he's saying, you need to do these things because the consequence of not doing these things is significantly worse than you can possibly imagine. The, the weight of the crushing judgment of God is horrific. And so God says, Listen, you need to follow what I've what I've put together because the the fact that I have put these things together and that they are all good can only remain so if you're obedient to me. The second thing we need to recognize uh, and share is mankind. That God created man in his likeness and his image. That he has put man in the garden to tend the garden and to continue to, um, uh, to continue to procreate and to have more and more people to fill God's world with his glory by having more and more children. And yet mankind in their selfish rebellion rebelled against God eating of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, and thus separating us from God's uh, perfect relationship, a perfect relationship with him. And it shattered not only our relationship with him, but our relationship with each other and our relationship with all of creation. Why do you think that the first thing that Adam and Eve did was put clothes on? Because they looked at each other and they recognized that, oh my goodness, we can't even trust each other now because we weren't even able to be truthful towards God and faithful towards God. How do I know then that you're going to be faithful towards me? And when we sinned, all of creation was shattered. And so what we see today is the result of sin. What we see today is uh, in the wars and the diseases and the sickness and the broken relationships and all of these things is a brokenness that comes from a direct result of the sin that resides in each and every one of us. And I say resides in us because sin is literally part of the human nature. It was not created that way. In fact, God created us perfectly and he would not have created us with a sin nature and then called us good. That sin nature entered us when we sinned. And now we carry around that sin nature and we need redemption. Just like any relationship that needs to be repaired, God says, I have to be able to forgive you. You have to come to me for acceptance and for forgiveness. And yet we waited and waited and waited for God to make the first move. And finally, finally, after sin had entered the world, that's the third point. Sin is wretched and destroys us. Fourth thing happened. God sent Jesus. 
Now, it seems like an awfully long time between the time that God uh, pronounced judgment upon mankind and the time of Jesus. But remember, he's saving people all throughout history, people who are looking towards the coming of the Messiah and holding fast to the promises that God will make all things right. And now we on the other side of the cross are looking back and saying God did make all things right. And so God sends Jesus. He lives a perfectly sinless life. He takes our place on the cross. God allows an innocent man to be crushed in order to save us from our sins. And on the third day, he rose again, giving us the great hope that he is the Savior who will raise us and who will bring us into the kingdom of God. And then the final thing is that we have to share if we're sharing the gospel is that we need to share that they need to repent and have faith. Repent means turn away from our sins, recognize that we are sinners in need of a Savior, and that that Savior is Jesus Christ alone who lived the perfect life, who was vindicated by God, judged righteous by God, and raised again bodily on the third day. And when we place our faith in Him, when we turn from our sins and place our faith in Him, we have the assurance that we will be with God, that we have been saved and are being sanctified and looking more and more like him each day. These are the elements of the gospel which we must share in order to effectively share the gospel. The world needs to hear that there is a perfect God, that there is a world that he made that was perfect, that he has a special place for each and every one of us, that sin entered the world and destroyed the relationship between us and God and between us and each other in creation. That he then sent his son out of his loving heart to offer forgiveness to the world. And all we have to do is take hold of that through repentance and then coming to faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ. Now, you may look at this section uh, and uh, of verses and say, but that's not what Paul says. That's not how Paul shares the gospel but first, I want you to remember the audience. Context is key. Paul doesn't need to go back and reshare the history of the gospel. He doesn't need to go back and reshare what God has said about who mankind is or about sin. He needs people to recognize that what he was saying about Jesus is true. You see, they had an, a clear understanding about the background of Jesus and why people needed Jesus, namely that God is holy, man is fallen, and in need of salvation. And so what he says in this verse, and I would point you back over to verse 3, it says, For I passed on to you as most important what I also received. So he's going back and he's going over what is most important, reminding them of the utmost importance of the reality of Jesus Christ's sacrifice and atoning sacrifice that he laid down his life, that he was a propitiation, the appeaser of God's wrath against mankind, and that he did indeed raise bodily from the grave. There is no greater news in the world than that Jesus died and rose again. The good news is not simply that Jesus did these things, but that death was fully and finally defeated. What once destined us for destruction, we are now, because of the uh, love and the grace and the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we are now destined not for destruction, but for new life. And the fullness of our sins is already paid for by the shed blood of Jesus Christ. See, that's the message that Paul wants to get back to the Corinthians, to let them know without the resurrection, none of these things are true. In verse 3, we begin to see what is probably a very early confession of the church. So some people would look at um, the church at, um, as Jesus had risen again and say, you know, there were centuries or there were years before people even came up with this idea that Jesus raised from the dead. But yet here we are in Corinthians, this is less than 15 years later that Paul's writing, and we already see evidence of the fact that uh, the very first message 
that, um, that Peter uh, pronounces in Acts includes the fact that Jesus did indeed rise from the dead. So it's not something that uh, occurred or was contrived by a bunch of people over a bunch of years. The gospel message wasn't made up in Paul's mind. It was confirmed to him on the road to Damascus and then again by the apostles. And now he's confirming it again to the Corinthians, letting them know that this is the truth. That this is an early confession of the faith that is not contrived. That this is what the early church believed. That Jesus Christ died and was raised from the dead by the power of God. And so the question that um, I want to ask you right now is this. What are the most important aspects of the gospel that Paul shares with the Corinthians? I just asked you, what are the most important aspects of the gospel message that Paul shares with the Corinthians? Well, if you read a little bit further on, you would see that Christ died in accordance with the scriptures for our sins. That not only did Christ die for our sins, he was buried and he was raised again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. First and foremost, the reality of Christ's death is crucial. Jesus didn't simply check out or pretend to be dead. Jesus died a brutal death for our sins. What we see is the wages of sin is truly death. That Jesus taking on the fullness of our sins, having no sin himself, suffered the full punishment, the full wrath of God against sin, and he bore it on himself. Isaiah 53 tells us that God smote his son on the cross, that he crushed his own son, and that he took pleasure in doing it. Now you say that's kind of weird that God would take pleasure in crushing his own son. Well, yes, but remember the purpose. He's looking at his fully 100% obedient son who is taking on the full weight of sin and he is crushing, crushing the fullness and the punishment of sin. And he is weighing that down on Jesus Christ. In accordance with, Christ, uh, with scripture, Jesus was killed for our sins. I mean, think about that for a moment. Jesus is hanging on the cross. God hates sin so much that he was willing to crush his own son. He was willing to crush his own son. Oh, how I would hate to be one who rejected the love of Jesus Christ. Who I, I would hate to be the one who said, I don't care what Jesus did for me. I don't care the work that Jesus has done. It doesn't matter to me. It doesn't matter. I will not repent. Can you imagine the heinous, horrors that await them as we see that God was willing to crush his own son in a horrific way how much more will he crush those who have rejected his son how much more the full wrath of God was being poured out upon his son you see Jesus was the only one who could take the fullness of that punishment and the only one who could vindicate us before God on that cross, Jesus had to die. He had to taste death to rescue us. I want you to think about this for a minute. Jesus, having existed in all of eternity, had never tasted death. And suddenly, suddenly, he is thrust into it. He's thrust into death. And when we think that he had no control over it, the Bible tells us different, right? I just read that, that he laid his life down for us willingly. The God of all gods was willing to lay down his son. The God of all gods was way, willing to taste death in order to redeem humanity. Jesus Christ lived the perfect life and he did the will of the Father and the will of the Father was to crush his son in order to make forgiveness possible 
And Jesus did all of those things because of his love for God and because of his love for humanity. Paul also reminds us that uh, Jesus was buried. Jesus was buried. He was literally dead. There was no way, no way that Jesus was alive on that cross. They, uh, there are several um, historical documents that show that when the soldiers pierced Jesus inside, that blood and water ran out. You are not surviving that. You have to figure that Jesus was beaten before that, something that some people wouldn't have even survived. And then he had to carry a cross, which he couldn't hardly carry himself. And that he was then crushed on a cross. So I have a question for you. What theories have you heard about how Jesus never really died? So I just asked you, what theories have you heard about how Jesus never really died? There are many skeptics in the world, many skeptics. Some people say that he faked his death. He didn't really die and he wasn't really in the tomb. Others say he was asleep, which if you're able to sleep during a flogging and a crucifixion, that's a miracle in and of itself. Third, some people would say that he was in a, a hypnotic state, that in some way he was able to hypnotize himself to make himself look like he was dead, and that the disciples just mistook that as death. Finally, the Muslims say that Jesus was a prophet, but God would never have allowed him to be humiliated on the cross in that way, so someone else must have taken his place. Paul sums everything up with this. He was raised on the third day in accordance with scripture. He could have been alluding to the story of Jonah or to one of the Gospels um, where he had heard that um, Jesus had said certain things about predicting his death and resurrection. But either way, what is clear for Paul is that Jesus did uh, indeed arise and uh, raise bodily from the dead. And he provides several proofs that Jesus is alive. So what proofs? did uh, Paul provide for the resurrection? Let's ask that question for you. Go ahead and take a look at the next uh, set of scriptures. It's uh, five through eight. And come up with a list of the proofs that Paul provides for the resurrection. What are the proofs Paul provided for the resurrection? I just asked you, what are the proofs that Paul provided for the resurrection. First, he appeared to Peter, and then the 12, and then the 500, then to James, and finally to Paul. There are several eyewitnesses who could attest to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Paul points each one of these out and says, some of the 500 may have fallen asleep, but there are still many more who were alive at this time. Basically, he's telling the Corinthians, listen, don't take my word for it. If you, if you don't want to believe me, don't take my word for it. Go and ask some of these other people who have indeed seen him rise from the, from the dead. In fact, there are 13 other recordings of Jesus' appearance post-resurrection uh, listed in the Bible. And I'll list those down below for you in the comment section or in the description section. I want to ask you a question, though. Because some of you may never have uh, encountered this, but some of you will encounter this. If someone were to ask you why you believe the resurrection is true, and not just because the Bible says so, what reasons would you give? So I just asked you, if someone were to ask you, why you believe the resurrection is true, and not just because the Bible tells you so, what reasons would you give? First, the list of people Paul gives uh, as eyewitnesses is incredible in and of itself. You'll notice that he lists James. And you might say, well, of course he would uh, go see James. James was uh, one of the disciples. Not that James. In this instance, he's talking about James, the brother of Jesus. Now think about that for a minute. 
James, the brother of Jesus, did not believe that his brother was the Messiah. He saw his ministry, he saw everything that he did, and yet he did not believe that Jesus was who he said he was. But something happened post-resurrection where James suddenly comes to realize that Jesus is indeed the Messiah, that he in some way has risen from the dead. That he sees his brother standing before him bodily and he is now boldly proclaiming that his brother was indeed who he said he was. In fact, what's interesting about this is that James goes from uh, being against his half-brother to being a leader in the Jerusalem church. And so we see that there is a human experience in which James moves from unbeliever to this radical believer that his brother is the Messiah and rose bodily from the dead and that there is great hope. He becomes a church leader. How crazy is that? And so we see that there's that proof in there. It's not just that the Bible tells me so. It's that we see even in historical documents that James was a leader of the Jerusalem church. That he goes from unbelief to being a powerful leader. And in fact, he even goes in to martyrdom at the end of his life. His life ends at, uh, at least the tradition is that he was stoned by the Jewish leaders. Notice that Jesus also appeared to the disciples. Now, you have to remember that after Jesus died, that there was a time where they were hiding in an upper room, where they were terrified that the Jewish people were going to come and take them away. You see, something happened. There is no way that these men came out with all power and authority proclaiming the resurrection of God when they had literally just a couple of days before been holed up in a room terrified to even show their faces. So if the resurrection of Jesus had never happened, where did the boldness come from for these men to actually go out and share the gospel. And one might say, well, that's fine, but that doesn't exclude the possibility that he was, uh, that he pretended uh, to die, where he hypnotized himself, where he had fallen asleep. But who's going to risk their lives for a person who is weak, a bloody, beaten, defeated, fake Messiah, who would have needed great care to keep him alive? The reality is that they did not meet a timid Jesus. They met a risen Jesus with all authority and it transformed them from timid people to powerful witnesses of the the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so we can say all we want. Well, maybe he didn't really die and somehow he got out of that tomb with soldiers there. But the reality is if a bloody beaten Jesus is showing up at my door, I'm not proclaiming him raised from the dead because he really doesn't have any power he's dead or as good as dead and all the disciples saw something else they saw a risen powerful king a risen powerful lord there's also the reality that the tomb was indeed empty some people say the disciples went to the wrong tomb Well, they may say that they went to the wrong tomb, which they didn't. But even if they did, how did they then see a resurrected king? That's what I thought. The religious leaders were never able to produce a body. They were never able to get the disciples to recant. They tried. Some say, well, you know, the the soldiers... Um, had fallen asleep and the disciples came and stole him in the middle of the night. Which begs the question, how do the soldiers know who stole the body if they were asleep? That's what I thought. You see, the tomb was indeed empty. The soldiers would not have gone to the Jewish leaders and said, hey, um, the tomb is empty. Uh, they must have stolen the body if the tomb wasn't empty. It would have been the soldiers' necks 
if they had failed in their mission to protect that which they were uh, told to protect, if they had fallen asleep on the job, they would have been executed. And yet they're going to the chief priest and saying, the tomb is empty. What do we do? So we have more witnesses, not just people who have something in in uh, vested in Jesus. We have other witnesses who are saying, whoa, the tomb is empty. So what do we do? The final thing that I want to run you through is this, that no one had anything to gain from proclaiming Jesus was alive. Nothing. In fact, it was more dangerous for the disciples to proclaim that Jesus was alive because that would have put them at great odds with the religious leaders. And yet they did it anyway. They, the only thing that, that faced them was death was persecution for Jesus, for proclaiming that Jesus had risen from the dead. They had no money, no fame, no glory, no power, nothing. Nothing that would drive a human being to the point of being willing to sacrifice themselves for the truth of the gospel, for the truth of something. Nothing, unless they saw a risen Savior. They had everything to lose, and yet they were willing to die to proclaim that they had indeed seen the resurrected Lord. Their lives were a testimony that what they were saying is 100% true. You have to look at the history of the world, and you can even go back just a few, um, a few years, 50-ish years, to where we have the, the Watergate scandal where it took less than uh, uh, two days for everybody in the Nixon White House to basically turn on the president when they saw the cards were lost, that there was nothing for them to be able to do, that they were going to save their own necks. And yet none of the disciples ever recanted. None of them. Because they saw a risen king, the 100% convinced that what they saw was a risen bodily king. And the message that they brought is that there is good news for the captive and freedom for the slave. That all of us who are under the curse of sin can now come into the presence of God through the full, uh, full um, forgiveness, of, with the full forgiveness of Jesus Christ and his sacrificial death on the cross. Listen, every single one of the disciples except for John was martyred. And they did it not proclaiming that there was good news, but proclaiming that they had indeed seen the resurrected king. Ladies and gentlemen, Jesus Christ is alive. He is alive. Some people will say, well, that's great, but that's all things from the Bible. Oh, there's so many different things. So many different documents in history that back up Jesus' resurrection. We have church fathers um, who had been with uh, the apostles. We have uh, different historians like Josephus, uh, who talked about um, the Christians seeing uh, Jesus resurrected, all of these kinds of things. Jesus did indeed die. That's, that's even recorded in history. Jesus did indeed die. And there's even evidence that he rose from the dead. Now, some of you might be saying, that's great, but how do I then go from that, uh, there's an empty tomb, to proving that he's living in my life. Well, a couple weeks ago, um, I did a Sunday school lesson on 2 Corinthians uh, verses, uh, chapter 4, verses 7 through 18. Um, at this point, Paul had been in Asia, and he had experienced extreme extreme persecution to the point of death where he actually thought he was going to die. And he writes this in 2 Corinthians. <clears throat> but we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying the body of the death of Jesus. Sorry, always carrying 
in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may be made manifested in our bodies. For who live are for we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus may also be made manifested in our mortal flesh. So death is not at work in us, but life in you. Since, this, since we have the same spirit of faith according to that which is written, I believe and therefore I spoke, we also believe and we speak, knowing that we that he who has raised Jesus from the grave will also raise us with Jesus and bring us with him into his presence. For it is all for your sake, so that as grace extends, more and more people may increase in thanksgiving to the glory of God. So we do not lose heart, though our outer self is wasting away. Our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal, uh, for it, sorry, for this <clears throat> a light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. Paul is facing extreme persecution. And yet he is writing that although we are clay jars, clay jars are throwaway jars in ancient times. God has poured the gospel and the spirit of his uh, uh, spirit of God into us. And that we are able to then live out the reality of the resurrected king by the way we live our lives. The power that raised Jesus from the grave resided in Paul and allowed him to carry out the uh, mission of the church and the mission of the gospel without hesitation, without fear. Jesus Christ was living in and through him and we have that same experience that the power of the resurrection is verified by the changed lives we have. The empty tomb is there to prove throughout all history that Jesus is alive. But the proof that is the greatest proof that we have that Jesus is alive is the power of the Spirit of God residing in us, allowing us to stand firm. Jesus Christ is alive. It is the greatest news of all time. It is verified throughout history and it is personally verified in each and every person that has come to him. I hope you're experiencing the power of the resurrected king. I hope that as you're sitting in your home today, that you are being sanctified and that you are pursuing Christ and recognizing more and more each day the beauty of the resurrected King. May you go boldly proclaiming that there is a Savior, a Savior who will never let us down, a Savior who defeated death and sin, and that death and sin no longer have the final say, that one day that the same God who raised Jesus from the dead will raise us from the dead and will make all things new. Take hope in that this Easter, knowing that Jesus Christ is King. He is risen and you are saved. Oh, how great it's going to be that day we see him in glory. How great it's going to be. Rest in that, knowing that Jesus Christ has raised from the dead.